So this was my office when I got out of college in 82. All those things used to be manufactured, shipped, trucked, shelved by the stock person, sold at retail, and one by one, each of them has been vaporized, has been turned into an app. So we don't need as many factories, we don't need as many physical items, anything that can be digitized will be digitized. So that adds further opportunity as each one of us now hold in our pocket a device that connects us to seven billion consumers. You are one click away from the majority of the world. If you're one click away from seven billion customers, you only have to be right for a nanosecond to become a multimillionaire or change the world. It's that easy. Now, there are a ton of exponential technologies coming out. The ones I'm going to focus on mostly today are what have already made it out of what's called the hype cycle. So Gartner does this study of what's the press writing about, what are we all hyped about, right? You know, where are our flying cars that we were promised, okay? Where's my hoverboard, you know? But augmented reality, we're now doing and saving clients billions of dollars in the B2B space, but I'm about to tell you it's going to hit, and very quickly in the next 18 months, the consumer space. And here's why. Getting back to what we've lived through. The computer allowed man to process and do stuff outside of himself. Huge change. But it didn't become relevant until we added the internet that took all that mankind's knowledge, all the sign, everything that we stored outside of our body, we all have equal access to it. Ah, I did not do that clicking. Back. Back. How do I go back? Back. Back. Back, back. I apologize. There we go. Um, then mobile allowed us to go and connect people to people. And this is what's really unique. For you starting your company, most likely all the talent you need is not in Austin or Houston or wherever you're based, but you can set up a virtual company with people all over the world. And that's what's happening today. But the fourth one is connecting people and knowledge to our environment. Give you the simplest one. Two kids were stuck in traffic in Tel Aviv. Not as bad as what I see here, okay? And they're sitting there and it dawns them, wait a second. The phone company knows where my phone is and knows where that guy's phone is. If they told me to go left and him to go right, there wouldn't be any traffic. They named their company Waze. Eight months later, with zero revenue, they became billionaires. It is that easy. Now, for those of you that are not engineers, and I'm going to be talking a lot about tech, guess what? Every single person in this audience has written at least as much code as Steve Jobs. Let that sink in. Insight, perseverance, everything else can be hired. Except a clicker. There we go. So let me just take you on a quick brief dystopian view of what this world will quickly look like. I don't want to fast forward. So, we're starting at the back of a bus, a kid playing games as he would do today, but everything you will see will be engaged. We will be able to see what the prices are, where's a vegan restaurant, all the things that you would want to see will pop up. But if every single person has access to you, it will be like pop-up ads were in the 90s. It'll be like being in Times Square on acid, not exactly the future that we're all anticipating. So, what it's going to ha come down to is just as there's a handful of apps that you rely on every day, there's going to be a handful of filters that you're going to add to your reality. And that's what we're going to talk about. Because for everything that was an app today, that's going to be a filter in the augmented world. And where the big companies, all my biggest clients, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, et cetera, are all spending billions on the space, they're looking at the big platform plays. The individual applications, pretty easy. I'm vice chairman of Deloitte, uh, independent vice chairman. And as part of Deloitte, you have to have a graph. These are mine, so I've satisfied my job. Um, for those that can't read them, 
what it basically says, this is the key one. This is the moment in May of last year when internet advertising exceeded television advertising globally. Why is that significant? Because again, if you're not looking at your phone anymore and you're not looking at your desktop, if those ads are not in that augmented world, you don't exist. But what's so unique about that is where television was fragmented across a whole bunch of different brands, there's a duopoly that makes up the majority of all global advertising. So there's two filters that we know are going to be there. How big is this market? We're talking about, in just the next handful of years, a half a billion headsets, okay? Let me put this in perspective. Last year, 2017, in the US of A, Americans bought 80 million pairs of glasses that cost more than $100 a pair, that only came with one app, Focus. A whole bunch of other people bought over 30 million pairs of glasses at over $100 a pair that came with only one app called Sunglasses. But what if your glasses had just one other app? They translate any sign into whatever language you understand. So you could go to Angkor Wat and read the menu in Cambodia, and you could go anywhere in the world and be able to communicate. If they looked the same, felt the same, wore the same, and by the way, some of the cool augmented glasses that are coming out actually beam the image to the back of your eyeball, which means you have perfect vision back there, so you don't need different glasses based on your prescription or changing prescription. So this isn't science fiction. And the money that's going to be spent, and remember, 2022 is not, you know, Star Wars future. It's around the corner. The best way to predict the future, and this is how I make my living, is by hanging out with the people coding it, okay? You know what products are coming out, you know when they're coming out, and you know what big chunks of the market they're fighting for, but there's huge opportunities. In-app purchases, mobile data, e-commerce. You can have a pop-up store anywhere. I noticed somebody has equipment for tailgating parties. Imagine above the parking lot is anything you want to imagine buy. Imagine going in a toy store and there's virtual inventory. Physical retail will now be able to compete. Why is augmented reality suddenly going to take off. The reason is we have a confluence of these technologies that are powering it. So cloud computing, as we roll out 5G networks, you'll be able to have all this knowledge go right to knowing where you are, that you eat at McDonald's four days in a row, it's two o'clock, you haven't eaten yet, there's a McDonald's that's 1,400 feet to the left. If I offer you free french fries, will you go? You're in a store, you're standing in the printer aisle, there are two printers, you've been standing there for eight minutes. Would I give that person a bigger coupon than the guy that just walks in, grabs the printer and goes? Absolutely. Every product in retail becomes variable pricing just like every seat on every plane. If you're not afraid of the TSA and you look good in handcuffs, try this. Um, just go down the plane and ask each person what they paid for, for a ticket. You won't find two people that paid the same price, okay? So chatbots, artificial intelligence, wearables, the internet of things, we're putting out billions and billions of sensors to give us more data to allow us to have more decisions made in real time. So the era of using Boolean logic, the era of searching, you know Google has the answer. You're just not bright enough to always come up with the right question. That era is over. The world will conspire to bring that information to you. So when we look at how fast it gets to a trillion dollar market, 2035, it's a multi-trillion dollar market. No one controls that market yet. No one has the killer app. If I would take you back in a magic time machine 10 years ago when the iPhone came out, anybody remember what the top 10 apps were? One was a cat game and one was a fart app, okay? How many ideas didn't they think of? I'm old enough to remember when they advertised PCs to go into the home so you could balance your checkbook. What's a check, okay? So what are people not paying attention to? All that entrepreneurs are, for those of you that think that you sell something, your business will fail. Entrepreneurs do not sell products. They solve problems. No one ever went into the store to buy a quarter-inch drill bit. 
What they wanted was a quarter inch hole. So they bought a drill bit and a drill and whatever else they needed. Solve the problem and you'll make this the, the solution. More charts. Skip that chart. Anyway, the size of the market's huge. I think I've, I've, I've bludgeoned that. But now let's talk about where it's going to be used. So video games, that's kind of obvious. Live events. Anybody go to a sports stadium lately? The in-stadium experience hasn't changed since gladiator times, okay? And some of the food they're serving, I think, is the same. They scrape it up later and sell it the next time. But when you watch at home, you get stats over the players, you get replays, you get engagement, you can talk to friends. Why can't you have that as a filter when you're in that stadium? Why can't that experience start the moment you walk in? Why can't there be a pre-show in the air? There will be. I'm working with a number of the teams, and there's really exciting stuff that's coming out. Investment is huge. So 40% of all venture investments are in this space. So here's a trick that the VCs didn't tell you I said in the earlier panel. I've raised between six and $800 million from VCs. VCs are looking at trends, and you have one of the richest ones standing in the back of the room. I won't point him out, embarrass him. He'll be speaking later. But they're looking for a wave. Wow, mobile's coming out. We should do something in mobile. This is the wave. How do you reposition your business as part of this wave? That's how you get funding. Surf where the waves are. Healthcare, huge field. There will be a shortage over the next decade of 135,000 doctors in the US, which means it doesn't matter how much money you have, there's not enough doctors, and you can't make them fast enough, they're not going to miraculously appear. But we're going to start having wearables that know our blood pressure, that know diabetes, that know everything about us, and we can have more control of that. Well, how does that person interact with that? Most likely it will be through augmented. Imagine that you know whether or not grandma's remembered to take her medicine. And then you can call her and say, Grandma, you didn't take your medicine. And if she figures out how you know, she'll stop taking her medicine, so you call. So huge space in wearables, and we're just at the beginning of what wearables can be. So wearables and augmented. So start looking at the intersections of these trends, and you'll see new business opportunities. So I talked about this. There are glasses. Now, glasses right now are $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, not a mass consumer item. But if I could show you a picture of the Google's first self-driving car, it had $300,000 worth of stuff up on the roof, and every exec in Detroit laughed. Today, all of that equipment is $53 in the price of a car. Everything else is software. Moore's Law. So the glasses are getting cheaper. Now, we've had augmented reality for a long time. It's adding things, OK? I'm not a big sports guy. I didn't know those stats weren't really on the field, OK? I thought a guy went out there and had to go with the chalk really fast. I said, man, he's good, OK? So what's different? What's different is how we can now use it. So I want to take you on the journey that I took to get here, OK? Having your boarding pass in your pocket or on your phone, the gate changes or whatever, that's an obvious heads up when you're sitting in the airport. How many of you have sat, and I do this, spend my life in airports, you got there early, you're at the right gate, you get lost in your emails, your own world, and then you look around, I wonder why the gate isn't crowded. Oh, they changed it. Solves that problem. Ahead of time, you could see through VR which hotel rooms. I have a lot of hospitality clients, and I'll tell you this. Those rooms that have more pictures get more bookings. Those with VR get the most. Anybody going to Hawaii, you have two choices of rooms. There is the ocean view, much more expensive, or the garden view. So your first trip, you'll take the garden view, save moon. Garden is code word for wall of hotel next to you. Um, so if you're going to Hawaii, spring for the ocean view. So now you see the room. Now you get into your room. Now you should be able to see, like Minority Report, what's around the city? Where's the action? Where's that pub that I heard about or was recommended? What's going on? And as you go down the street, again, the same thing. Now, you can also tie this into your LinkedIn because you go to an event like this and you see what's her face from that company and I don't remember. Hey, Sheila, how's your dog, Rusty? So you can have all that so everybody can be insincere. Today we can do all this with phones. 
Pokemon Go showed that you can make a billion dollars and people are willing to hold a phone or a tablet. But it proved that people will do this. It'll be much easier if it's just what you're wearing. So everybody can imagine this. I'm not going to talk so much about that, but I want to talk about the other side. So much of what you hear about augmented is adding things. I live in Los Angeles. Augmented definitely means adding things. Okay? But thank you for the one courtesy joke. Um, but you can also subtract. The typical supermarket has 40,000 SKUs on those shelves. Each one carefully designed to pop off and jump and be noticed next to the other one that was designed to pop off and be noticed until, again, it's a cacophony of noise. You just come from the doctor and the doctor tells you, you have hypertension, you have to watch your salt. Are you going to read the packages of 40,000 packages as you go down the aisle? No. You're just going to say, show me the products that are low sodium, and everything else will disappear off the shelves except those. Or paleo, or halal, or kosher, or gluten-free, or what Oprah recommends. So if you're not in that database, you don't exist. Going the other way, catalogs can now come to life. The number one reason stuff is returned at Ikea is not because you couldn't figure out how to use an Allen wrench. It's because people are spatially challenged. They buy the 12-foot sofa for the 8-foot room. Now you can lay the catalog on the floor and walk around and see the items at scale. In construction, you can have Superman-like vision. You can see through the road. Oh, there is a cable down there because it's tying to the plans of the city. Let's not drill here. Or let's not dig here. Firemen can go into smoky building and see exactly where the walls are because it's all tied to the CAD CAM systems that were already done in the designing of the buildings. Here's one of my favorite ones in construction. And things are booming in, in Texas. There's a dude or dudette whose job is to climb up that crane in the morning, and at 10 o'clock, they look at this monitor and they move the thing from here to there. I'm very technical. And then at noon, they move another thing from there to there. And occasionally, there's high winds and storms, and those fall over and crash, and those people die. Now, imagine that not only are, do you have glasses that do all this, but you're sitting in an air-conditioned office and you're running the crane in Dubai, and Chicago, and San Francisco, and Shanghai. No different than how we fly drones today. More efficient, more experience, less jobs. Anything that can be automated will be, okay? Seeing a pattern. Your drive through window, where you get to hear the person go, that's gone. It's not being outsourced overseas. Chatbots. Chatbots now have better human comprehension. Your Alexa, your Siri. Syria. So all of these things are conspiring. We're now using this in fast food, working with a number of clients. So the person orders the cheeseburger with no cheese, you've made that a thousand times. You're not even thinking as it goes through. But if you don't see the cheese, if there's no cheese for you to grab, you can't grab it. It just vanished until the next order, and then it's there. So you only see the components that go into it. The order comes right up here. By the way, in VR, you can practice your muscle memory without having to shadow a person. So more efficient, you come on the job fully trained. This is my all-time favorite. When you're sitting on a plane, you've seen those big metal containers that they slide under the plane? Those are filled with overnight packages. Again, back to my dude and dudettes, there's people whose jobs are to throw packages into those things. It is not the most fun job for most people. Turns out, spatially challenged people. If you do the job longer and get good at it, you put 30% more stuff in one of those. If you could get everybody to that level, you would have one-third less planes. Save two billion in jet fuel just for one client, okay? So we've turned the job into 3D Tetris. The glasses identify the shape, put it in, where to do it. If you get a high score, you get paid more for your shift. If you don't, Maybe you find a job that doesn't require those skill set where you'll have more job satisfaction. I recently did a piece about um, UPS. Fascinating. 
UPS drivers spend 48% of their day, and if we had time, I'd have you play the guessing game. Guessing doing what? Not loading, not unloading, not driving around. Spend almost half their day in the back of the truck looking for where are the packages that they put in in the morning. Now with AR glasses, when they go back there, they know exactly where it is. Again, you can reduce the number of trucks on the road. Training. Training has been the same forever, the apprentice method, okay? There are two fundamental flaws with all training that AR and VR solve. Number one, by the time you get training materials, they're out of date. So the knowledge can never be up to the moment. Number two, I've yet to meet a person of any skill or IQ that has 100% comprehension. So what's going to happen is training is going to be how do I use the VR or the AR interface and it'll walk me through step by step how to repair an engine, how to repair an electrical pole, how to launch a missile, doesn't make a difference. You don't have to retain the knowledge, you have to know how to use the system. So suddenly you'll see that. And the same will go for consumers. No more fig one to fig two, okay? That was my generation, okay? Now, it'll all be animated right in front of you, what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And a friendly person to walk you through. So, that's what's happening, and that's what's happening very quickly. In security, you can then tie this to not only facial recognition, which you just saw they recently caught a bunch of people that way, but there's software that can tell whether a person has a shifty gait if they're nervous. You can also check everybody's vitals, heart rate, if they have a fever, if they're coming in with, you know, some rare communicable disease. So, you are the next generation of entrepreneurs. What are you going to do to compete in this rapidly changing world? So, let me just tell you the keys. Number one, data beats opinion. Data is your best friend. Data is your mistress. Invite data to every meeting. Data will never steer you wrong, okay? A, B, test every decision. Your partner thinks it should be red, you think it should be green, run an ad, see which gets more click-throughs. I sold a company uh, in the ad tech space that went from the VCs wanting to close it to 18 months later for $200 million, and all that we did was A, B, test everything we could figure out of what's wrong with advertising until we had the highest CPM rate in the world. We averaged a $1,000 CPM from all the biggest brands, Toyota, Microsoft, Disney, didn't matter who, because we had the greatest engagement, all by being micro-focused on data, okay? But more data requires more creativity. You can search online and find out my height, my weight, everything on my Wikipedia page, but it doesn't tell you if I'm a nice guy or not, okay? So don't be intimidated by the data. You can be overwhelmed by the data, Figure out what's meaningful in the data, okay? Next thing is, you'll never get your big idea sitting at your desk doing the same old, same old. All the big inventions in life came from places where there are crossroads of different cultures, different ideas. Most of your big businesses have pivoted, okay? In this very city, Twitter, a music company, was launched, okay? It didn't work as a music company, it had a second life. Anybody know what YouTube originally was? A dating site. It's called Tune In Hook Up. The very first video was a guy at the zoo talking about why you should date him in front of an elephant. <laughs> Guys are clueless. Um, but they looked at the data and no one wanted to date these losers. It was a failed company. But the data showed them something they didn't expect and women can relate to this. You're not gonna date that guy, but you're gonna show that video to every one of your friends to show this is what's out there, okay? So they saw that these videos would go viral, so they got rid of the dating part and just realized, let people put up videos, and they became billionaires one year in business after that, after that insight, okay? This was the hardest for me to understand. When I started my first company, I did it because there were no jobs, so what choice did I have? Um, you have no limits. Only you can stop you. These sound like tree-hugging fake aphorisms, but they're absolutely true. If I had to sum up everything in the simplest 
mindset. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I just talked about two failed companies that are multi-billion dollar companies because they pivoted, because they changed. In my book, I talk about what I call the zombie ideas. Most of your ideas when you start your companies suck. I'm telling you, VCs will never tell you this because they're hoping that they make a relationship the next time you come in, it's a better idea. But what happens when you go into the woods chasing that bad idea, you'll get further into the jungle than anybody ever spent the time or money to go, and aha, now you come up with a good idea. So the more cycles you can do on why your idea sucks before you start spending money, find 10 apostles, 10 potential customers, not relatives and friends and well-wishers, people that will tell you, I would not buy this because. And then keep on solving until you get an idea that can't be killed and then you have a zombie, zombie idea and then funding is easy. Every single person thinks of changing the world Yet no one thinks of changing themselves. Disruption really starts with introspection. If you can go past those things that you were told that you're not good at, those things that you were told that you can't do, those things that is now a voice in your head. Your parents, your teachers, your well-wishers didn't want you to fail. That's a big mistake. Spending your life listening to people that gave up on their dreams is not success. The biggest mistake you can make is not making any. And the biggest regret you have when you get to be my age, is not the things you did and failed, but the things that you failed to try. Because again, in trying them, each thing is a learning experience. The difference between failing and failure is the key to get through your mind today. Failing is learning what didn't work. Failure is throwing in the towel and giving up. So, the key is to look at every obstacle as an opportunity. If you have problems in your life, Congratulations, you're halfway there. Because odds are other people have that same problem. And most likely you have a problem that isn't the same problem as a bunch of kids graduating Stanford going down Sand Hill Road with a very limited view of the world. So it's your diversity, your uniqueness that gives you a competitive advantage. So look at every opportunity that's out there. That's what a business should be built around, solving a problem. And no obstacle is so big, back to that perseverance, that one person with determination can't make a difference. In fact, isn't that what all progress in history was about? History is the recording of stubborn people. Everybody's laughed at in the beginning. I have friends that didn't invest in my first company that are then mad when it was sold for a bunch of money. How come I didn't let them invest? And I don't want to remind them I went to you, but you thought it was dumb and thought I was dumb. So don't listen to those voices. And the last message, this is the last of the five points, the world keeps on changing. Would you go to a doctor my age if he told you he hadn't learned anything since he left med school 30 years ago? Of course not. Would anybody hire you if you haven't learned? So you have to stay up on what's changing because, again, that's where the opportunity is. You don't have to invent the technology. You don't have to figure out how to reach 7 billion people. You don't have to know how the phone works or the computer works. All you have to do is solve a problem using the tools that other people built for you to leverage.